Mark Bowen, I'm director of the Soft Matter Program here. That's um, based in the physics department and funded by the uh, College of Arts and Sciences of Syracuse University, for which we're very grateful. So our idea was to, since uh, not, not everyone knows what this field is about, and since it's quite a diverse, um, we decided to organize a series of sort of lectures to give people outside the field and inside uh, some idea of the various things that we do. So I gave one talk about a year ago about some of the aspects of matter. And in uh, just over two weeks, uh, Lisa Manning, also from the physics department, a member of our program, will give a, a lecture on sounds of this order. So that's Wednesday, October 29th. That's going to be um, same time, same place. You have to write here in what you see it. Uh, I to get the word out and bring friends and people from the community that you can. Uh, so this will be the first real uh, public lecture in the series with uh, an outside speaker. And we're very lucky to have today Professor Sriram Ramaswamy, who's visiting from the uh, TIFR Center for Interdisciplinary Sciences in Hyderabad, India. Um, Sri Ram uh, was educated first in New Delhi in India and then got his BS at the University of Maryland and went on to do his PhD at the University of Chicago where he first studied uh, general relativity and then moved into theoretical uh, condensed matter physics and statistical mechanics and into the area that he's uh, going to talk about tonight. Um, He's made many uh, contributions to physics, but I'll just point out um, one area in which he's been recognized. So for the kind of thing that he's going to tell us about today, he won the uh, 2011 InfoSys Prize uh, in the physical sciences. It was a major prize in India, and uh, well, internationally, but awarded India. Um, and it's given for his pioneering work in the field of active matter. It enables a detailed exploration into several aspects of the collective behavior of living systems as interacting mechanical identities with distributed input and dissipation of energy. I hope um, by the end of the evening you'll have a better idea about what some of those things mean. One of the interesting things about this prize uh, is the, the prize money. So the, pri the prize money is 50 lakhs. Okay. Now what's a lakh? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? A lakh is 100,000 rupees. So that's enough to fit in a suitcase. Which is another word for a lakh. So Shira now has 50 suitcases which <laughs> enable us <laughs> traveling around the world. He's got a lot of baggage. <laughs> um, didn't help him getting through our here airport. Uh, <laughs> still costs him less than enough. After uh, finishing his PhD, he went for a postdoc at the, the University of Pennsylvania. And then he moved to India and has moved to the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India, and is very influential in developing um, Indian science. A lot of great people have gone back to, uh, to work there and, and build their academic careers in India, in all fields of science, and uh, physics in particular, and Sri Ram has been one of the leaders in that area. Very recently, there's a very well-known uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, TIFR, in Bombay, or Mumbai. But very recently, they decided to establish a second major one, and Sri Ram was the director of that. So that's a TIFR Center for Interdisciplinary Sciences. And they're taking a campus and a building and hiring experimentalists and theorists uh, and computational people from all of the areas related to this very broad area of physics. Um, we have some also, some uh, personal demonstration of active matter from uh, Sri Ram. There, there are two. Um, so one I can show you. Uh, <laughs> this is at our old house. <laughs> Making a snow angel. <laughs> if you 
you go on the web, you can also find um, Sri Ram playing cricket. Oh. <laughs> now there's a saying in English that it's not cricket. That means uh, some unsportsmanlike behavior, either on the sports field or in life in general. And I have to say that throughout uh, Sri Ram's scientific career, with all the uh, major scientific contributions he's made, I have never seen him doing anything that could be remotely called uh, accused of being, it's not cricket. All of his, of his interactions have been carried out in a very warm, you know, positive, and extremely civilized way. And for me, that's the true uh, hallmark of an intellect. So I'd like to welcome you here this evening's lecture on mass movement. Thanks very much, Mark, Stina, and all of you uh, for inviting me to this talk and for that great introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to be among friends. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So this is I actually the, the title I wanted to give for my talk was this, and this rather pathetic-looking picture. He's up there because I took this picture. I'm very proud of it because I took it with a dumb phone, not with, with a sort of cheap phone camera, and then pressed a button that said enhance. And uh, this is a scheme of uh, cormorants over the place near where we live, and that's an example of the kind of spatial organization that we're interested in studying. And of course, this is more remote, so I have to walk over here. Um, did you unmute? I'm tempted not even to use this gadget to point. I'm so tell me, <laughs> No, ready to point. Okay. All right. So um, that's what I work, and uh, that's what it looks like right now. It's a little rented building. That's where the main campus will be situated. That looks like Australia. Uh, that's what the first building should look like, and that's what the countryside around looks like. That's the building under construction. So we are a sort of motley crew of people who do all across science. I've deliberately shown it in this manner because we don't have a department of infrastructure. Uh, I've also shown it because of many young people in this room who might be looking for positions, and you should most certainly uh, keep us in mind. Uh, as you can see, we're very liberal about what we consider interdisciplinary science. Um, I will be telling you about the work of some of my students. I won't be telling you about these people's work. I will tell you a little bit about Harsh, Surapriya, and his work, probably not on yours. Um, and uh, just to give you an idea of what flocking looks like, I'll show you a movie from India, from uh, Bikaner in Rajasthan, where an interesting amateur photographer has been taking movies of the Indian Maya forming spectacular flocks over the sky in that interesting small town in Rajasthan. Uh, and uh, even though the guy who's taken these movies, I don't think he's a professional studier of bird behavior, you can see that these videos show you that the birds, A, are cohesive, and B, uh, have entered spontaneously, presumably, into a state where on very long time scales, now pretty big length scales, there's large scale coherence in their velocity vectors. So they're all moving together. They're sort of looking at each other and somehow managing to line up and move together. And you can see that it's a very dynamic kind of order. This structure fluctuates on a medium time scales in shape, in direction, but it's a great deal of internal order. So clearly, and also it seems reasonable given the direction is changing, it seems reasonable that the birds seem to have entered the state not because there is some external uh, you know, conductor saying go that way. They've done this by looking at each other. And this is why we're interested in this phenomenon as physicists. There are um, other groups studying it in more detail, most notably in Rome, where they mounted a bunch of uh, cameras on the rooftops of uh, Rome main railway station, and they take lots and lots of images and then try to do the statistical physics of starving flocks uh, with them. Um, 
So uh, the, that tutorial introduction was to tell you that uh, I'm interested in spatially uh, coherent movements of uh, living things. And the point here is to tell you that that kind of spatial order can occur on an enormous range of length scales from uh, huge schools of fish or the bird clocks I showed you down to the inside of a single cell and many scales uh, in between. Uh, this picture is also to tell you that you can take out some of the stuff from a cell and get structures that have similar kinds of order and you can imitate it with completely dead stuff as here. So I'll say a little bit about many of these things at various points uh, in the talk. Um, so now, the kind of movement I'm interested in is not this kind of movement. This, to use Stephen Brush's term, is the kind of motion we call E. It's Brownian motion, and this talk is primarily not about Brownian motion. Uh, yeah. It's about this kind of motion. I really wish you could get this. So, um, this is a common occurrence uh, on the University of Hyderabad campus in the uh, early monsoon. It's long-range orientational order in a collection of millipedes. These things get together for reasons that I don't understand. Assemble into pretty big. You can get ones even bigger than this. But this one is nice because it's remarkably ordered. And as far as I can tell, you know, I don't think they're following a gradient. They're somehow, you know, this is like a mini stampede or something of millipedes. I don't know exactly why they're going or where they're going. But it's an interesting system. It's you know, it's a two or three millipedes thick, and these guys are moving along, and the ones at the back are climbing on, and it's sort of factoring movement by which the thing keeps moving. We don't understand this, but my friend Sunil Bhala, who is a electrical physicist, uh, and I uh, are studying this already in some detail, trying to look at correlations in the orientations uh, of these objects on the, over the time scale in which exists. Now this thing, for some reason, is starting to settle down here. Again, I don't know why. Um, but then it seems to move again. So this is a sort of continuing story. You don't really know. But this tells you broadly the kind of systems we're interested in. Particles or entities that take up fuel, extract usable energy, run some internal machinery, and move and you know, get rid of some of the leftover energy or chemicals. So that's, and we call these systems active matter. Okay, and you can imagine that kind of movement on scales as big as a whole big organism. Uh, or on scales as small as the little machines uh, that are responsible for essentially all the movements we make. You know, the macroscopic movements we make are the result of a coordinated execution of movements on a nanoscopic scale. We are full of uh, nanoscale motors of many different kinds that walk on uh, filaments, nanometers in thickness and micrometers in length. Uh, you can take a bunch of these motors and take this end and graft it to a solid surface. So these guys are now sitting with their legs in the air, and the other end, which biologists for some reason do not call a head, uh, grafted to the surface. And then you can sprinkle on this a bunch of the filaments on which these things normally walk. So now these motors are anchored, and their legs are flailing like this. So um, like some sort of scene at a rock concert, where you have people floating on a Mat of a number of people. You have these filaments running around like this, and what they look like. And this was first really demonstrated about maybe 30 years ago by Cronin's uh, footage. Uh, you will get moving images of. So now the motors are moving, the motors are waving their feet, and these, these uh, filaments are running around. And we'll come back to this kind of study at larger concentrations in a few. So that's the kind of system we're interested in. Um, hopefully there are at least a few non-physicists in the audience to whom this question may occur. Of course, some physicists may also wonder, why study this? But first of all, we are physicists. When we see patterns in nature, we ask, we scratch our heads and ask ourselves, what's behind the pattern? So it's partly just pure curiosity, which leads to understanding and new science. But really, if you can understand the organized movement of animal groups on a big scale, uh, or of uh, bacteria on a smaller scale, you can probably do something with it. Uh, and the same kinds of structures repeat themselves, as I told you, even on scales smaller than bacteria, inside a single cell. So if you want to understand the mechanics of a single living cell, you do need to understand these things. Uh, and another point I want to make, 
use it is claim that um, so the tragic uh, stampedes that have taken place in places of pilgrimage like Maha uh, have actually been managed better by an understanding of the uh, and the point where those tragedies no longer happen and it's argued that uh, this site is better. So for all these reasons, it's a pro class of problems worth studying. Now here you can ask different kinds of questions. One is you can ask why questions. You know, why, why is that? But for any living system, a why question really only has an evolutionary answer. You can't really say, oh, well, it happens because these things are set in a certain way, because then the next question, why are the parameter values at that level? It's, they are set that way because it turned out to be favorable evolutionarily. And there can be loads and loads of different reasons why you get the plot in here. Then you can ask, whether plots form because there's one well-defined leader and everyone is following that leader, or whether the main source of interaction is between the, the large mass of members of the flock. You can ask whether the interaction is local or long-range. You can ask whether it's chemical, mechanical, or visual. And really, you can make up any kind of story about the system you like. You then have to check it against observations and controlled experiments. Uh, an adequate check requires writing down a model and doing theoretical and simulation will work on it, and then comparing to experiments. Um, the reasons why organisms flock are surprisingly diverse. Um, if you have a pack of bicyclists, they tend to form these, these organized groups because the ones, you know, the ones in the back can draft off the ones in front. If you have a bunch of birds flying in a formation like this, it is currently argued that they are not drafting in the sense of reducing drag. It looks like the birds in front, the updraft from a given bird helps the neighboring birds gain lift rather than reduce drag. Uh, if you look at, oh, I don't show you this video, but if you look at uh, slime modes, similar slime modes, uh, their formation of a big pack and moving coherently is a starvation reflex. Uh, it's a, an effective way of finding food. Uh, and most bizarre, uh, marching locusts, it turns out at least one very big family of them the local reason for the flocking interaction is because locust A wants to eat locust B, and locust B wants to escape locust A. So instead of two spins and a magnet doing some fancy quantum mechanics and lining up, these two locusts have a very asymmetric interaction. The one behind wants to eat the one in front. And this turns out to lead to global alignment and enormous parades of uh, marching locusts across uh, regions in Mauritania, for instance, which they uh, then. Um, so you know, that's sort of uh, a tourist guide to reasons why things might flock. And as I said, physicists enter because we look very interested in how matter organizes itself. But more specifically, we are interested in ordered phases of matter, in particular phases that are called liquid crystals. Liquid crystals, the simplest liquid crystalline phases, are systems made of elongated molecules, which, while remaining liquid, are there rules of the game about whether people can interrupt in the middle or not? So actually, you know, given the informality of this lecture, if something strikes you in the middle of the lecture, please do put up your hand and ask me. I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, you get a random state, a striped state in which bands, moving bands of flockers assemble and move in the same direction, and a conventional ordered homogeneous flock. And these kinds of images which came out of the simulations and which now are being understood on general theory really seem to describe experiments on uh, blocking phenomena in extract from the interiors of cells. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, one last example of other people's work. Uh, it's widely observed in many situations where self-propelled stuff is confined to a finite region then you get circulatory motions like this. And these kinds of circulatory motions turn out to be a more or less inevitable consequence of the kinds of hydrodynamic, uh, modified hydrodynamic equations we write down to describe flocks. Uh, again, I won't go into detail, just, just to say that it's not as though you need to do anything very detailed or program the system very carefully. If you confine active matter, it circulates. Okay, so now uh, having, uh, I hope, done some justice to the many different contributions that people have made in this field, let me start talking a little bit about the work we have done.
and probably how much extra time can I claim? How much of the techno snafu was my fault? <laughs> I think. Am I? All right. Worry about it, just. We'll improvise. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we got interested in this the problem of clocking because we realized that the early simple models of clocking were just rule based. That is, you got agents; they line up with each other and they move. They weren't rooted in mechanics. They weren't rooted in collections of particles interacting with forces, and they weren't taking into account the fact that clocking often takes place in a fluid in which if somebody is moving and changes their velocity, that conveys a disturbance through the fluid to others. So we wrote down the equations of fluid dynamics for collections of self-propelled objects and realized that broadly the typical swimmer either moves like bacterium by pushing fluid backward and moving forward, or like an alga by pulling fluid towards itself and moving forward. And broadly these give rise to extensile and these to contractile flows. Uh, this type of flow can also be produced by collections of biopolymers and filaments as done by the Brandeis group of one type. And these types of flows can be, are, the, are typical of what happens, for instance, in uh, the inside the skeleton of a living cell or in muscle tissue. So broadly you have extensile and contractile objects in a fluid. These objects can produce fluid flow and these objects can line up with each other either by bumping into each other or by or through the fluid uh, itself. <clears throat> Among the very quick results that uh, emerged from this analysis was an answer to a seemingly silly question. Is a collection of dead bacteria more viscous or less viscous than a collection of live bacteria? And you can ask the same question about other kinds of swimmers. So it turns out things that push fluid out along their axis uh, are easier to make, it's easier to make them close. You, you put on a flow, they line up, the flow that they are generating pushes in the same direction as you are So you gain. In fact, stuff like this can start flowing all by itself. And these guys, which are called pullers, you line up and they pull back on the flow. So these guys' swimming activity enhances the resistance of the liquid to the flow, and these guys promotes uh, the flow instead. And experiments really see exactly these, two, these tendencies in these two cases. So this is something which one of the early successes of what is called active hydrodynamics. Um, another thing uh, we realized is that, again, as a useful consequence of the equations uh, we wrote down, if you, have, if you start with a state in which everybody is swimming in the same direction, and you disturb it slightly, and when you disturb it, you disturb not only the orientations of these particles, but also the directions in which they are acting on the fluid, because that's determined by which way they're pointing. And so if you disturb it in, let's say you've got a bunch of um, pullers, and you start out with them all pointing parallel, and you disturb them in a splay-wise way, then what you do a little thought will convince you that this region will pull fluid that way, this region will pull fluid that way, and will tip over the guys that are already tipping in that direction. And likewise, if you have pushers, you get a system that's unstable to this kind of region. And this, again, uh, several groups have worked on this idea, and uh, you can call it a generic instability of oriented active matter. And it does seem to be seen in uh, bacterial systems, and it was first observed in sort of computer experiments on filamentary swimmers, and uh, more recently, rather stunningly imaged in uh, the von Wintogic's group in Brandeis of an extract from a cell in which these guys are in fact of the pusher type, and they form these spectacular unstable structures of just the sort that was predicted in our early work. This is something on which uh, several people in this room uh, have done some very, very beautiful work very recently, which we'll ask, you, ask them to tell you about at some point. Um, you can take these same ideas down inside a living cell. Uh, this little blob here is the nucleus of um, fibroblasts, I think. Uh, and on long time scales, the time scales of how much is that? Uh, 40 minutes, something like that. Uh, this thing rotates ever so slowly. You take a cell, you put it in a fixed geometry with its boundaries fixed, and you find this nucleus starts going round and round. And so you're asking, well, what's happening? Is it being prodded by microtubules? Are there specialized machines doing this? It turns out, as far as we can tell, if you just describe 
this particular cell in the confined geometry as a circular region with fluid with these flow generating filaments and the nucleus has a higher viscosity passive blob in there. You find the equation we wrote down directly lead to uh, the kind of flow that's observed inside the cell. So this is the angular velocity as a function of distance from the center, and this is what's seen in the experiment. And not only the profile, but even the numbers uh, roughly correspond. Okay. Okay. Now um, I want to devote the rest of my talk to uh, not real living motile systems, but imitations of motility. So you probably played at some stage of your life with camphor boards or soap boards. You take a little matchstick or toothpick and put something on one end. You change the properties of a fluid emission state, like you put camphor or soap. Or soap the interfacial tension of the water at one end will be different than the other, and this thing starts moving because of surface pressure gradients created by that. <laughs> Similarly, although not identically, on a much smaller scale, you can imagine taking a particle and putting it into a fluid which contains an unstable chemical. For example, the hydrogen peroxide. So you take this stuff and you put these objects, one half of which is a catalyst which promotes the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. You do that, and what you find is you will then have an imbalance in the population of the relative amounts of hydrogen peroxide and water on these two sides. The interactions of those two species in the surface produce a fluid flow close to the surface and set this object into you can see this motion, this isn't Brownian motion, this is strongly directed motion. So each of these guys becomes a swimmer whose moving parts are just the, uh, the chemicals and the fluid uh, around. And so this was studied, this invented really by both of Penn State. And uh, we've been doing some studies on this. Let me not even spend time explaining exactly why that happens. But the questions my students, Shurabriya and Dr. Gilsani and I asked, uh, well, if you put one of these objects in a uniform medium, it starts moving. What if the medium contains more chemicals there than here? Will this thing know that there's more chemical there and turn its head and swim towards it? Or will it know that maybe it doesn't want so much, swim away from it? It turns out you can actually imitate these kinds of functions. You can design the way you coat the particles with catalyst, and uh, you can have something that can line up and go in the direction of more fuel, and you, you can basically quantitatively design which kind of behavior is going to happen. Then you can put a bunch of these together. Now imagine putting a bunch of these in a uniform medium. Each one will modify the chemical cloud around it, and the others will sense the gradient. So you can have them scattering off each other, accumulating towards each other, and doing all kinds of bizarre behaviors. And because everything is happening through a, a chemical cloud which diffuses, the interactions can be quite uh, long-ranged. And you can get trapping, you can get scattering, you can get weird paradoxes if you have two particles. Uh, and if you have a whole collection, you can get a, a pretty baroque range of behaviors, including things that look like gravitational collapse, uh, things that look like plasma oscillations in a conductor, spontaneous oscillations, and so forth. And this is in the plane of the deorienting tendency and the gradient climbing tendency. If you have a particle, it can turn to point towards or away from the gradient. It can also move in response to the gradient regardless of which way it's pointing. And those are the two parameters that turn out to be important. And you can get a cool range of behaviors. There's <coughs> some computer experiments which are now seeing behaviors that resemble the oscillations uh, that we predicted. The last topic is um, the silliest imitation of cell profiling, which is the same thing that makes your cell phone rotate on a table made by you. So here, instead, we'll vibrate the table. You play, take the table and shake it up and down vigorously, like that, but much faster, a couple of hundred times a second. And you sprinkle on it a bunch of rods. Uh, if the rods have both ends looking the same, then they'll sort of shuffle back and forth. If they have one end different from the other, they'll walk in one direction. So in fact, um, this, this idea was the idea that you can make rods that walk was from Masaki Sano's group uh, in uh, Tokyo. And the idea that you could study rods that don't walk was ours. Meanwhile, here's a rod that's walking. This is a top view. This thing is on a horizontal surface. It's being shaken up and down. 
it's five millimeters long and one millimeter thick. And there are these beads around here which, for this purpose, aren't important, but I'll come to in a minute. And you can see these guys just walk. If you wait a long time, you have a big table, the direction in which they walk itself will change. They will start doing on long length scales and time scales, a random walk. But it's a very directed uh, kind of random walk. Now the idea is, well, you know, one of these is orientable and follows its nose. If you have a bunch of them, either because of collision or because of something else, can they form a flock? Okay. So uh, we studied this first actually in the context of rods whose head and tail were the same. You might ask, why on earth should anything interesting happen there? And the answer is that even though an individual rod doesn't know head from tail, there are interesting defect structures which have thereafter been seen in systems like the Brandeis Group's studies on uh, So here you can see a little defect structure with the nose. There you see a defect structure with kind of triangular. This one has a sense of direction and can move. This one doesn't have a sense of direction and stays there. This is one of the first observations we made that we thought was of some significance for understanding cell propulsion in these systems. And we used that system uh, in uh, what the experimental geometry. This is a couple of about a meter high. It's a machine that's usually used to test whether you can ship your products by truck over long distances and whether it stop working. Uh, but you can also do real science with it. We borrowed it from our chemical engineering friends initially. And that's the sample cell, it's about 15 centimeters across. It's one rod thick, slightly more so these things have a little room to fill. Uh, glass lid so you can see what's going on. And this thing is shaped up and down like that. And it's two-dimensional, so it's a circular plate. And you get uh, in the case where you start with rods that whose two ends are the same, they don't go anywhere individually, but they form these rather dramatic looking ordered structures. Very dynamic. And uh, this was first used several years ago to confirm a prediction that even in a system where nothing was being born or killed, you could get huge local fluctuations in the population in these uh, structures. Most recently, we've been working on systems of particles that, of the sort that I showed you earlier, that is, where one end is more is tapered relative to the other end. Um, again, the same geometry, the thickness is about a millimeter, the length is about five millimeters for now. There's a little bit of room above. As I said, the idea is that the way these things walk, uh, the way these things move is by tilting and walking. And uh, so now the idea, Nitin Kumar and Ajay Sood, a colleague at the Institute of Science, um, studied a collection of these guys in a medium also containing a bunch of beads. Now, You'll ask why, and first just watch the, you know, don't say anything, just look at the pretty picture. So this is a collection, this one layer thing. The rods aren't riding on the beads, they are at the same depth as the beads, more or less, and nothing really dramatic is happening. The rods are just running around. That boundary shape designed by uh, Olivier Dosho is just to prevent things from accumulating the edges. You've got these rods just running around like crazy. The beads don't seem to be doing very much. By the way, the beads by themselves, suppose you have no rods, the beads by themselves do nothing because the way the rod moves is by tilting and you can't tilt the sphere, or rather, you could tilt the sphere, but you wouldn't know it really tilted. So, um, so no drama there. Now, all you do, keep the number of rods the same, just fill it, make it slightly more full of beads, okay? So you increase the concentration of the stuff that isn't motile. You increase the concentration of stuff that looks like just filler. And what happens before your marbling eyes is, it's not the best for me, I can show you the better one, I think the better one on the web somewhere, is the rods spontaneously somehow talk to each other without even bumping into each other and form an alliance, sorry, it's looping, you can watch it again. If they form this rather beautiful, spontaneously aligned state. If you run the experiment again, half the time it goes clockwise, half anti-clockwise. So there's no bias in here. It's spontaneously chosen. So um, our first no, my cynical first reaction when I saw this was, oh look, all that's happening is that the boundaries are lining it up. 
then I thought maybe what's happening is that, you know, the presence of the beams is preventing the rocks from rotating, so they're bumping each other, line up, and then they stay lined up. So I thought of various debunking explanations uh, for this, all of which turned out to be wrong. It turned out this was something real and really cool. Uh, and the way we convinced ourselves is my student, Harsh, uh, did a complete mechanics simulation. He has the rods, actually, which are made, geometrically speaking, they're made, the collision rules are done by putting them as arrays of beads in different areas. Um, and uh, he has, they obey Newton's laws with inelastic collisions and static friction against each other, against the lid, against the base. So you can, he can put in anything you like. The advantage of that is you can very think, if you can't do so easily in the experiment, and see what is important. So what he did was he sort of recreated, I know there is this a expression by some literary critic about art must not make a copy of life, one bloody thing is enough. But this is not really a copy, you're changing things that you can't change in life. And uh, so Hush uh, first reproduced Nitin's experiments. Uh, of that, let me just show you a case at high beam density where it does order. And it's really, very really pretty. Maybe even prettier than the experiment. And here, just you know, just for uh, completeness, this one will happens to go clockwise. And you can really see that they're somehow getting in touch with each other through this medium. And uh, that's the question, right? What's going on? So then we said, look, it's a pain to have boundaries. On a computer, you can make a box in which if you go out one edge, you come in the other edge. So Hush did that. And at low concentrations of beads, uh, nothing dramatic happened. The guy goes out. I mean, they, they move around at random. But at high bead concentration, they flop. So you have to wait a bit. So studying this uh, systematically, we realized that, uh, or I should say, there is a, yeah, studying this systematically, we realized that what you have here is what we call in the trade a phase transition. Um, this is fractional area covered by beads, fractional area covered by rods. So there's any point in the, Actually, the way you define is you take each object, you look at its shadow, and you take that as the area it's occupying. And as you can see, you go, if there's two Q rods and all beads, things are disordered, pointing every which way and moving every which way. If you increase the area, if you sit at a quite low concentration, let's say 5% uh, concentration of rods, you increase the bead concentration enough, so that very, very dilute collection of rods manages to communicate among itself and line up. Okay? The only difference between high concentration rods and low concentration rods is you need more beads. But the beads by themselves can do nothing. The beads can only do what they're doing in the rod um, And you can see, uh, if you go to very high concentration, some stuff gets stuck, but we still haven't investigated. And you see the same phenomenon, which more or less, with more or less the same numbers in the computer study. You tune a concentration continuously, and you have something singular happening. Below a certain concentration, there's no coherent motion. Above a certain concentration, there is global coherent motion. This is what, as I said, we call a phase transition. Um, you can read about this in the recent issue of the digital communication. Um, and uh, this is a measure of how ordered the system is. You take all the velocity vectors of all the rods, add them up, and divide by the number of rods. And that gives you, the magnitude of that number is this one thing, B. You plot it as a function of B area fraction. And you can see this is a very well defined concept. You can do this both cleanly and in the computer. And in the computer, you can study larger and larger systems. And you can see that this concept gets more and more well defined. I haven't shown that yet. And <laughs> so then we scratched our heads for a while and got various things wrong. And then we realized what was happening. In retrospect, it may be simple and maybe obvious. The idea is the following. It's always obvious afterwards. The idea is that if you have one rod moving, it disturbs 
the feed medium around it in a characteristic way, in which basically it pushes fluid outwards and fluid comes out inward in this way. It's very different from what you have for swimmers. For a swimmer, you have somebody moving forward, you have two lobes of fluid in front like that, and two lobes at the back. These are actually different. The reason is that all of this action is taking place in a monolayer in contact with two solid surfaces. So most of the force balance, just like when you walk, when I walk, the main force balance isn't between me and the air, it's mainly between me and the ground. So in systems like that, you get a flow pattern that looks more like an object moving under an external force for the effect of the human bodies. What you should note is that the sphere is moving this way and out to about four uh, rod diameters, the velocity is in the same direction. So one rod moving this way, and you can change the distance out to which the velocity persists by increasing the concentration of the bead. So this is interesting. If you think of the beads as cargo, you increase their number, and you seem to make their transport more efficient because they kind of lock to each other. And you can see that here. This is the decay as a function of distance in bead diameters. And information that's not this, that's not bead diameter, it's distance in units of bead diameter. Um, and you can see that at high uh, bead area fraction or bead fraction area concentration, the decay is much more gradual. And uh, <coughs> next part of the story is okay, one rod moving produces a flow that way. You put another rod into that medium, and let's say it's pointing in some arbitrary direction. Does it turn to point the same way as this rod, or does it turn the opposite way? You could conceivably imagine, although we haven't been able to build a particle like that, that the rod is pivoted in such a way that it moves the wrong way. But let's say, okay, let's say there was a rod going that way up the screen. It produces a flow like this. You put another rod pointing a thwart it. What will happen? It turns out it gets turned to point the same way. And we tested this in the computer experiment, uh, or touch tested it, uh, by the following expedient of um, putting a, starting a rod moving that way. And now switching on a bead flow in that direction, what would happen? It does. You can measure, so first of, what, what this allows us to do then is to write down a hydrodynamic model. Um, so this is the equations part of the talk, I'm sorry, I have to show. In fact, most of what I talked about, we first did the maths, and then we made up the stories. Okay. It's not like we were so clever that we guessed the answer first. Uh, but it's just nice to present. But then I also have to show you that I can, we can solve elementary math problems. So all you really need to look at here is the rate of change of the local velocity is proportional to the local orientation with a factor alpha. And the rate of change of the local orientation is governed by the local velocity with a factor lambda. You can see that if these two both have the same sign, then a little bit of orientation locally produces the velocity, which promotes the orientation. And so these will feed on themselves, on each other, and bootstrap themselves into a spontaneously moving state. The rest of it is details, which are important, but the main thing is we can measure every one of the parameters here in Hirsch's computer simulation. We can measure them as a function of beat concentration, rod concentration. And so you can work out what the phase diagram should look like, even quantitatively. Okay. Um, and in fact, everything goes exactly the way uh, it ought to at this stage, right? And uh, just in more detail, that's telling you about the conservation of the total amount of stuff. This tells you about damping of velocities locally and with respect to passing momentum to others. This tells you about forcing, that's coupling to the density. This tells you about how flow orients things. This tells you about how a given orientation randomizes. Anyway, you can you can take all this stuff and you can ask at what total concentration, rods plus beads, should the phase transition happen? And that phase transition take it from me is where these two curves intersect each other. And you can look at these values, and in fact, it turns out to work rather nicely when compared to the experiment. You can also do another thing, you know, in many phase transitions, as you approach point of onset of watering, you start to get more and more correlated uh, movement. And you can measure, this quantity tells you, if I've got one guy pointing this way, a distance r away, what is the probability that another guy is pointing the same way? And you plot that as a function of distance. And as you approach, as you tune the bead concentration, you find that decay gets lower and lower, uh, equally true uh, in the simulation. Uh, this doesn't prove anything precisely about the character of the transition, because they're small systems, but it suggests that there's an enhancement of uh, 
directional uh, correlation. So, okay, I'll start to wind down and finish the talk. Uh, there are various things which we are measuring. Many of these things, even though they're experimental questions, uh, <coughs> are easier done in simulation. The physics of corrections of macroscopic particles is such that you can't read, it's much easier to do a computer simulation in a million of them than an experiment, because these, each of these objects is a millimeter in size, and you need a table that's, what's a million millimeters? A thousand millimeters. No. A thousand millimeters, so I take the square root of that, sorry. It's easier to do big simulations than big experiments, which is a bit ironic. But we're checking about the nature of the ordered state, the nature of the transition, uh, whether the homogeneously, whether you have these strange bands that I told you about in these simple flocking models, whether you have uh, big density fluctuations. There's various people who contribute to these ideas. Um, and let me just show you one example. If you uh, go, if you look at the ordered data, Take regions with on average n particles and ask about the excess in the fluctuations. You take a region and measure how many particles there are from moment to moment, calculate the mean, calculate the standard deviation, and then take the standard deviation divided by the square root of the mean. In normal systems, like the air in this room, room that quantity will be independent of the mean. But here, generically, you find there's excess, and that excess seems to be larger the more ordered the state is. And these features are examples of why of that happening near the onset of order and in the order state. But much more fun, I think, is this question of fact. I told you, right past onset, flock isn't homogeneous, it's striped. Can we see that? Well, Hutch has been studying these. And this is what the onset of flocking in Hutch's model looks like. In the computer experiment, he's imaged only the rods and suppressed the beats so you can see what's going on. And you can see that little by little clump develops, and that clump, as you wait, becomes a traveling band. And you can, it's difficult to do very, very large system sizes. These are very computer intensive uh, uh, calculations because you are doing Newton's laws and collisions and so forth. But it's very interesting that a system in which the interaction is not obviously the same as what VTX model would have had, you know, things inspect their neighborhoods in a line. The interaction is very indirect, still. Uh, behaves like such models. This testifies to the efficacy of models based on very general principles, whether agent-based or uh, hyperdynamic, because they describe many more systems than you might naively have thought you would do. Uh, anyway, so um, I think with that, I'll be close and I can answer questions. Uh, this, this second one. So what we've done is first, there's new science all around you to keep your eyes open. And the living world is probably the most exciting source of new, uh, new physics. And maybe physicists can actually say something useful about those systems. And I think it's fair to say that the various groups working in this area have now a reasonable theory of the organization and mechanics of living matter, living in the sense of actively metabolizing. I won't say that we understand systems in which the memory of what we would want to sell, what we would make in the next generation is stored in this generation. Replication and uh, genetic information is not there in the other stuff, only the relatively trivial aspect of metabolism and mobility. And uh, it works on an amazing range of scales. You can build imitations of it in some rather cunning ways. And uh, this has really opened up, it's opened up problems that biologists were already interested in, but it's really opened them up more to investigation by physicists on all these areas. And with that, I close. Thank you. Imagine you had a bunch of birds all trying to follow the lead of one person, 
as distinct from cooperativity where each one lines up the others. The analog is in a magnet. If you, if you have a collection of elementary magnetic spins and you put on an external aligning field, they will align in proportion to how strong the field is. But in this interaction, they align disproportionately more. And that uh, the fact that cooperativity uh, amplifies the organizing tendency in these systems, I think that's without a doubt. Whether there is a leader, whether there is a unique leader or a rotation, I think depends, uh, varies from system to system. Yeah. Uh, so, earlier in the lecture, we were talking about uh, systems that don't communicate through the fluid that they're in. Right. Uh, in the second half, you talked about these two systems where you are communicating information through fluid. Right. Is it possible to approximate these more complicated systems with the simpler systems where you're not uh, communicating through the fluid? Good question. Actually, some of what I said amounts to a demonstration of that approximation. If you have bulk fluid, then the nature of the interactions, so you know, imagine you, you don't have, in the last bit that I talked about, you've got a kind of fluid, you've got this bead medium, but it's in contact with a solid surface. In situations like that, each guy's communication is pretty much damped out out of a finite distance. That distance itself can be tuned by increasing the concentration of beads. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have bulk fluid, the character of the interaction is very different. The disturbance field produced by one swimming organism decays very slowly with distance, as one upon the distance square, and with a characteristic uh, angular pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, that is poorly approximated by simple agent-based rules, to such an extent that in the agent-based models, you can get ordered states in the bulk fluid models that I showed you with those things of everything going crazy, you actually can't. They're intrinsically unstable. So there's both, both, both cases are possible. Yeah. Enjoy your talk. Um, what are the um, details that you claim in the physics that the experimental cannot see? And the vice versa. So, um, so you have an experiment and that which is limited by various things, including the system, the time resolution, and so on. Right. What do you, what is the type of information that you can reveal that they cannot see in their, their experiment? Ah, uh, actually, I would say, oh, and, and that is probably very helpful. Yeah. So let let, let let me try to answer that. Let me try to answer. Actually, let me. Let's do an analogy with more ordinary physics. Supposing you were doing solid state physics and you wanted to figure out the nature of the interaction between two molecules in a system by measuring the, you know, the thermal phase diagram, temperature and pressure, whether you get a liquid here, a crystal, etc. Actually, it's hard, right? Because many systems with very different microscopic interactions produce roughly the same kind of general map of what kinds of phases you get. So, Macroscopic properties are a little insensitive to details of interaction. Nevertheless, uh, you can get some information. For example, it was by comparing simple clocking models to real world clocks that one was able to get enough information to figure out that simple interaction rules in the microscopic model were inadequate. So um, <coughs> I think rather than I think the point is this. What we are best at predicting is large scale, long time behavior. Organization on large scale. What we're not really good at predicting is precisely at what value of some parameters some change will take place. And what we're even less good at predicting is what exact interaction takes place. Nevertheless, if there is something as gross as, well, they are not, they're na the nature of the interaction isn't distance based, but topology based. That kind of thing one can figure out with a lot of back and forth between experiments. Um, they, you know, for example, experiments that they cannot perform mm -hmm. with their limitations. But within your limitation, sure, of those stuff, that are meant, those are points which that, that is called the most there, 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 you can vary parameters in the computer simulation once you've decided this is a reasonable model. And you know, maybe propose new systems that people haven't built or people any system that you can study by mutation or something, uh, that you can certainly do. One of the things you 
So if you have theory, if you have a detailed computational model, then you can play God. You can change any parameter. Like we did actually in the granular in these last simulations. Yeah. Is the uh, Yes. The number, I mean, so this is this question of, yeah, so we actually, we haven't, if you act, I didn't show you the beads, the beads also tend to accumulate in the same region. So it's, at some level it's both, but if you have, if you have a lot more beads than rods, uh, you do get a diffuse amount of beads outside. So basically, the band, the, the band width, Actually, Christina can answer this question better since you guys are facing it. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm, just, I'm not getting the lever rule right. I mean, uh, basically, the, 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 the packing density you get in the bands isn't really determined by how, uh, by how many rods you have. Only the width of the band is determined by how many rods you have. Um, so the band width, right there. Yeah, there's sort of roughly dense regions with well-defined order with a certain favored density. And how wide those dense regions are depends on how many rods. But it, it depends is also not symmetric. It's much denser at the front. Yeah, so there's a profile. The Actually, I know. I'll, of, uh, if you're denser interested. Denser at the front and then tapered at the back. I'll be, so it, it turns out, interestingly, that this, gran this granular system uh, allows you to probe all of those. Uh, so I, I'll be giving a more technical talk on Friday in which I'll talk about these kinds of issues more. But basically, broadly, the width is determined mainly by how many you want. Christina has or was going to, in fact, had the equation. Mixobacteria? Yeah. Here, talk about I have not, we have not started that. It's a very worthwhile thing. Some, there are groups who have done it. Uh, yes. Not us. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's, you do what's. Uh, so, what, one, of the, one of the ideas here is if you can explain something as purely physical or yeah. mechanical, you don't need to find any no, I think what he's saying is you can vary parameters but by, you can, by, by, by Yeah, system. you can use mutants the same yeah. thing. So that's something that we haven't we haven't not to have done, but yeah. It's an opportunity. But some other people I think have to some extent availed themselves of that option. Uh, but there's probably more. I think this is the yeah. You talked about you know, you talked about primarily about flocking and behavior right. and behavior of objects relative to, to each other. This reminds me, this whole talk reminds me, I was sitting with a wildlife photographer who was trying to follow this, the flying pattern of a particular turn mm -hmm. that he didn't know at, a, at 200 meters. And I spent an evening with him where he was talking about whether or not he could predict mm -hmm. that behavior. And it's, I was never... The turns are solitary, right? And they're long. They're more of a solitary. It was a solitary. Yeah. It was yeah. a marsh turn. It was mm -hmm. a whisker turn. But the, the, what I'm getting to is, is that I learned in the course of a full evening to anticipate his learning and to anticipate his camera work and then to unify the movement of what he was studying. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was very interesting. You know, you could, you could, you could essentially view the physics of that bird through his motion, mm -hmm. right? And I just, I just wondered if there's any relationship of that, that measuring technique to what you're trying to because you're, you know, it, it's the anticipation of a micro behavior. Um, I, I, it's just something I was thinking mm. about. So you're saying basically because he was following the turn, right? You could kind of, you could suss out what the turn was about. To yeah, do and when when they were in in, in synchrony, I see. it was quite beautiful, and I could I could understand the motion better from studying both the observer and I the observer. I see. So that's actually at a two organism level, some kind of synchronization physics. Right? 
Yeah. So one thing they didn't talk about is that all of these self-propelled objects have an internal cyclical motion. And the description I gave you was somehow averaging over that, not resolving that. Just saying it, it's a mover. You can ask what happens if that cyclical motion itself is coherent across the whole block. We have done a little bit of work on that, uh, which would be too technical to present here. And that's an example of studying synchronization within the system, not between observer and system. Right. Okay. Um, I suggest we continue the discussion.